have to say. Um, yesterday was World Ocean Day, so we think it's fitting that we offer this program tonight on coral reefs. My name is Stephanie Pearson. I'm the Environmental Issues Chair for the League of Women Voters of Broward County, and I'm here today with Monica Elliott, our Broward League President. The League of Women Voters is 101 years old this year. Uh, we are a nonpartisan organization, which means we never support or oppose any candidate or party, but we do take positions on issues after study and educate and advocate for those issues. Uh, we have an active environmental issues committee and you're all welcome to join us. Uh, coral reefs are critical to our environment and are suffering due to climate change and other factors. Tonight, we are fortunate to have with us two researchers and activists working to mitigate the damage and restore our reefs, Maddie Kaufman and Liv Williamson. This program was supposed to be live streamed on Facebook. We have a few technical difficulties, but we are recording it and it will be available. Uh, we ask that do you put your questions in the chat and we'll address them after both our presenters are finished. Uh, I'd like to now introduce our two speakers from the University of Miami, Rosensteel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. Maddie Kaufman received her Bachelor of Science in Marine Science and Biology from the University of Miami's Rosensteel School in 2016, and then her Master of Science in Marine Biology in 2020. She conducted her research in the Benthic Ecology and Coral Restoration Lab under the advisement of Dr. Diego Learman and focused on examining what extrinsic and intrinsic factors contribute to healthy reefs, looking at coral performance metrics such as growth, wound healing, and thermal tolerance. Maddie now works as a research associate in the Learman Lab and as the program and outreach director for Debris Free Oceans, a Miami-based nonprofit dedicated to eradicating marine debris from our beaches, reefs, and oceans. Following her presentation, we'll hear from Liv Williamson. Liv Williamson is a fourth year PhD candidate with Coral Reef Futures Labs at University of Miami School of Marine Sciences. She studies ways to help vulnerable corals survive and adapt to changing environmental conditions. Liv specializes in coral reproduction, testing novel intervention strategies, to create robust new generations of corals for reef restoration. Liv is passionate about science communication and public outreach, working to involve young people and members of the South Florida community in ocean conservation. So uh, Maddie, are you uh, ready to, for your presentation? I think we need to share the screen here. Yes, I will go ahead and share my screen. Thank you so much for the introduction and for inviting us today. Um, can you guys hear me okay and see my presentation? Yes. Awesome. Well, again, yeah, thank you yes. so much for having us. We have some really exciting research happening at the University of Miami between both the lab that I work in, the lab that Liv works in and beyond. And so we're really excited to share this with you guys today. And so just a quick outline of what I'll talk about before handing it over to Liv. I'm gonna start with just a little bit of background in coral ecology, um, just cause I'm not sure everyone probably has varying levels of background knowledge. And then we'll go into why reefs are so important known as their ecosystem services. Then we'll go into the uh, number of threats they are facing, but then the really cool solutions that we're starting to uh, dive into uh, more and more every day to preserve this super valuable ecosystem that we're so fortunate to have uh, right in our backyard. And then we'll go into some of the basics of restoration, how the field started, how you guys can get involved with that, and then pass it over to Liv to dive into how we're really using research to maximize the success of our restoration efforts. And so to begin, I like to start with the question, you know, what is a coral? If I'm in person in a classroom, 
let people raise their hands, especially if it's kids. And I'd like to end with the fact that I think it's a trick question. I think it, corals should technically be defined as three things. Technically, they are animals. So that means they are heterotrophs. They actually feed from the water column and they use that for uh, to make energy. They can't make energy from sunlight themselves. So corals are by definition an animal. Uh, but they're also very similar to a rock. As corals grow, they deposit a calcium carbonate skeleton or limestone skeleton downwards as they grow kind of upwards towards the sun. And that's how they build these kind of rock-like structures that you see boulder corals create. Or in this image above, it's a branching coral and that's how it forms and elongates those uh, branching structures. So in that way, it's kind of like a rock. Um, but it also is like a plant and that's because uh, within the coral tissue there is a unicellular algae and there are millions of them uh, within the corals tissue and that algae actually photosynthesizes. So it takes sunlight, uh, makes sugars and then translates this energy to the coral host and it actually translocates like 90 to 99 percent of the energy that it creates. So very important to the coral. So in that way, uh, also similar to a plant. Uh, but to zoom in, corals are colonial organisms. So the actual unit of a coral is that coral polyp, which you guys might have heard of. You can see some of the polyp tentacles in this zoomed in picture. Uh, if you wanna picture it, it kind of looks like a jellyfish turned upside down living within those cavities in the, in the skeleton with those tentacles that go out in the water and feed. And within a coral colony, all of these polyps are genetically identical and share resources throughout. And so we like to compare it to a hotel where you have a bunch of rooms within the hotel that are all very similar, uh, but they share resources throughout the building and function very similarly. So then if you zoom in, uh, need a microscope, then you can see the uh, symbiont, that algae that lives within its tissue and translocates all of that important energy uh, to the coral host. And I like to emphasize how amazing and cool it is that these small coral polyps that can fit on our fingernail have built structures that we can see from outer space, from satellites during the daytime. We can't say that about anything that humans have built. We can see our structures when it's nighttime and the lights are on, but that's not the case during the day. And again, that's because these corals, as they grow, they deposit that uh, carbonate, calcium carbonate skeleton downwards. And when there's a reef ecosystem with a bunch of these hard corals, they're all growing and accreting to build that reef structure. That's what we see from space. That's so important to the functioning of a healthy reef. Um, and so we end up with this complex structure that, again, is hugely important to the services that reefs provide to us and to the rest of the environment. So to name just a few of the ecosystem services that our reefs provide, um, a huge one is coastal protection. So some studies have actually found that coral reefs can buffer wave energy by upwards of 97%. And so what that means is when we have these big storms coming in, they hit the reef first and it reduces the wave energy that that storm had originally created. And that protects our coastline from so many potential harmful impacts from these storms, from the waves themselves, from uh, the storm surge and the whole nine yards. Also food for billions. Uh, so many fish species that we depend on live at some point or depend at some point on the reef, whether it's their juvenile stage, their adult stage, all of their life. And this is becoming more and more important as we're transitioning away from meat-based diets in the interest of climate change, uh, but we still need our uh, societies to meet that protein demand. And then there's also economic opportunity from that commercial fishing that I was kind of just describing, also from recreational fishing, recreational diving, uh, recreational snorkeling, uh, so important for our tourism economy, especially here in South Florida. Another one is pharmaceuticals, uh, some compounds that we find on the reef that we use to um, treat some of our ailments are found on the reef. It's because these organisms, are, they hypothesize, it's because these reef, uh, reef organisms are sessile, they're benthic, they can't move. So to defend themselves, they've uh, created these defensive chemical compounds that we can take advantage of for medicine. 
And so this has led uh, NOAA to estimate that uh, Florida's coral reef actually has an annual asset value of $8.5 billion. So very, very important. Uh, but unfortunately, like you mentioned in the introduction, coral reefs are facing a laundry list of threats. Uh, the biggest one really is climate change. Uh, the warming temperatures uh, causing the warming temperature of the water actually breaks down that symbiotic relationship that I described between the algae and the coral host, uh, causing the corals to expel that symbi or those symbionts. And so that's called coral bleaching. And I like to emphasize that coral bleaching is not coral death. Uh, some that's a common misconception, uh, but when it's prolonged, it can lead to mortality. And that's because the corals lose that really important source of energy, but they can recover. And Liv will talk a little bit about how sometimes you can take advantage of that recovery process because it can increase their thermal tolerance in the long run. Uh, also on the notes, on the note of climate change uh, is ocean acidification. And so the increased carbon being absorbed by our ocean makes it more difficult for our corals to secrete that calcium carbonate skeleton. And it's making that skeleton more brittle and more prone to uh, reef degradation. Climate change is also leading to increased intensity and severity of storms. Uh, the greater the storms, the more likely they're uh, to cause damage and wreak havoc on our uh, reef ecosystems. So climate change, really one of the biggest threats our reefs are facing. Climate change, they also uh, believe is increasing the vulnerability of coral to coral disease. And we're currently in one of the biggest disease outbreaks Florida Corals Reef has seen. Uh, known as Skittle D, which is a pretty silly acronym for a very uh, scary disease. It stands for stony coral tissue loss disease. Started in Miami, it has progressed all the way up to the St. Lucie Inlet, all the way down to the Dry Tortugas and has been um, observed further south in the Caribbean, affecting more than half of our uh, species on the reef. Coastal development. As we build up, we have sedimentation that can uh, reach our reefs. Also, as we increase our population, there's more anthropogenic stress that can reach our reef and land-based pollution. This pollution can be in the form of marine debris, of plastics, uh, also nutrient pollution. When there's excess nutrients on the reef, uh, algae or macroalgae, not the symbionts, but macroalgae takes advantage of that and can actually outcompete corals for space and smother corals in extreme scenarios. And on that note, overfishing, we've fished out some of our important herbivores and those fish herbivores are also important for feeding on that algae that I just described and controlling those populations. So as we've overfished a little, it takes out that uh, control on algae overgrowth as well. And so this has caused coral cover in Southeast Florida to reach about 1.5%, according to uh, data from uh, 2016. But fortunately, uh, so many sectors of society are getting involved and working towards solution to save our reefs. Uh, so to go into some solutions, obviously the first thing we need to do is combat what caused coral decline in the first place. Uh, that's our priority so that our restored reefs can succeed for future uh, generations. And then we've also uh, started some marine protected areas. So we close off certain areas of the reef, prevent uh, fishing, pre there are no take zones, you can't lobster, uh, fish or not fish, boats can't anchor and cause damage. So marine protected areas uh, have been enacted as part of the solution. Uh, we've been taking care of some pollution mitigation by uh, preventing some of this nutrient pollution and septic uh, leakage from reaching our reefs, uh, preventing this marine debris from getting into our oceans. But then what I'll mainly focus on for my talk is coral restoration as a solution. And again, we really want to use this restoration as a means of sustaining populations while we uh, eliminate the stressors that caused the decline in the first place, so then they can uh, proceed to seed future generations of coral reefs. And to complement that is really awesome research to make sure we're conducting studies to see how can we best carry out our restoration efforts so that it maximizes success. How can we incorporate thermal tolerance, disease resistance, uh, any way to improve our efforts. And so to go into some of the basics of coral restoration, 
or, or coral gardening. I like to say it's very similar to what we've been doing on land for decades. There's a nursery where we grow out healthy colonies where they do really well. And then once we have enough of the organism or what we're trying to restore, we go to an area in need of restoration and we outplant the, um, the organisms there. And so what does that look like? I kind of divided this into both uh, a section about branching corals. Uh, so that's the branching morphology where they actually form little finger-like structures and grow that way. Uh, but also, and then separately for massive corals or mounding corals that create those boulders, uh, commonly brain corals or star corals. And they're pretty similar, but a little bit different. And so when it comes to uh, uh, restoration, we initially collected a couple of colonies from the wild, uh, but not a lot because we don't want to cause more, ham or more damage uh, than good when we're trying to restore these ecosystems. So we collected a few colonies uh, from the wild a couple of years ago, and we bring them to our underwater nurseries. And underwater nurseries can look very different depending on what program you're working with or learning about. Uh, we like to use the coral tree method, which is the image in the top left of this middle section. It's just a PVC tree about my height, and the corals are strung with uh, monofilament fishing line. But again, you can set up A-frames, you can just put the corals on cement or on cinder blocks. And the theme with all these different methodologies is that the items that you need to make them are readily available and are pretty affordable. And that was intentional when the uh, field started to develop because we wanted these methodologies to be replicable throughout the Caribbean and throughout the world. Um, and it didn't need to be uh, contingent upon what resources were available. So we grow out these corals in the underwater nursery. And then once they're big enough, we can collect from the uh, coral tree. And then we can either take it to the reef and attach the coral to the reef, or we can move it to another location in the nursery and use it to propagate our standing stock of coral tissue. And so this is asexual propagation or asexual reproduction. And that means we're creating new colonies, but it doesn't involve gametes fusing and creating a new genetic individual. And Liv will go into a little bit of how we are now starting to work with uh, sexual reproduction, which is super exciting. Uh, but wanted to emphasize that something that's really important for this process is the fact that our corals exhibit pruning vigor. So that means that the more we fragment to them, it actually increases their growth rate. And you, that's uh, seen in rose, uh, growing roses. And it's really visible in this picture. So you can see you have the initial corals and then eight months of growth to the right. And then we fragmented those corals down. And after another eight months, you can see that they've grown so much more after they have been fragmented. And so this has really allowed us to increase the number and just the amount of healthy coral tissue we have in our nursery without having to continue collect from the wild. And so onto massive corals. So the previous species I was just describing, the staghorn coral grows very quickly. It can grow like 12 centimeters per year, uh, but our massive corals do not grow nearly that quickly. They can grow like one to three centimeters per year. And so we were like, how in the world do we even work with something that grows that slowly to actually scale up? And it became really important as the Skittle D outbreak really impacted our massive corals. It's actually a really funny story of how they discovered what to do. Uh, researchers at Moat Marine Lab actually had a big boulder coral and accidentally dropped it. It broke into really small pieces. And then they noticed that those really small pieces grew really quickly. And so they started exploring with it and started intentionally cutting corals into very small pieces and ended up developing this process known as microfragmentation. And so that's when you take a colony from the wild and cut it into small, almost quarter size micro fragments. And that can increase their growth rate in some instances to three to five centimeters per month, where it used to be a centimeter per year. And that's because they're small, they're no longer investing energy into sexual reproduction. They feel very uh, evolutionarily pressured to uh, grow and establish themselves and uh, claim up some space. Mm. And so, Yes, we collect from the wild. Sometimes we have little rescue missions where we've collected from the Port of Miami from an area that they're about to uh, construct a, diff a 
a new location for a cruise ship. So we went out there and collected boulder corals from the area before they did that. We bring them to the lab, cut them into these small pieces using a diamond bandsaw. And then you can either grow them out in the nursery, like in the top picture, or in the lab in the bottom picture. And so that background picture is a table, uh, a nursery table structure that has a bunch of micro fragments on it. And then similar to the branching corals, as they grow out, then you can either take them to the field and plant them back onto the reef, or you can bring them back into the lab and re-microfrag to again, continue uh, increasing the standing stock of coral tissue that you have. So then on to outplanting, now that we have so much tissue available in our nursery, uh, there are a lot of different methodologies for outplanting as well. Uh, the common theme is that you kind of sit down and see what your resources, what resources are available, and then you want to evaluate, you know, what's most cost effective, what actually works, how well the coral is surviving, and then how scalable is it? Like how long does it take you to use these different methods? So these top pictures here are of staghorn coral again, and on the left is what we used to use, which was the hammer and nail method, where we would hammer a nail to the reef attach the coral to the nail with a zip tie, and then uh, the coral would grow over the nail, again, deposit that limestone skeleton, envelop the nail, and attach itself onto the reef. But that was a very slow process. And you have all these tools, you have hammers, nails, zip ties, corals, brushes. Um, so it wasn't the most efficient. Uh, we'd also tried working with epoxy, which is just a two-part putty that you mix together uh, it makes a little Play-Doh type material. You use that to attach to the reef and it hardens within about 45 minutes after you uh, put it out. Uh, but that was really expensive. And now we are using cement, which has been really, really great for us and for the field. The corals do super well. It's very cheap and it's very efficient. We just mix the cement quickly on the boat, uh, put it into piping bags, literally what you use to ice a cake. And then you dollop that out onto the reef and then attach the corals into, uh, into the little cement dollop. And so we've largely been using cement uh, for our massive corals as well. And when you're working with massives, you can do different uh, types of designs. Like for example, on the furthest left, we just attach the micro frags right onto the reef. Uh, in the middle, you can see it's actually a coral pizza, we call them, whether it's, it's just a cement structure. If it's a triangle, we call it a coral pizza. If it's a circle, we call it a coral cookie. And we put the corals on that ahead of time and then attach that directly to the reef. And then on the far right, one that I've always found super interesting is called reskinning. And that's where you find an old boulder coral colony skeleton that had already died. And you put a cluster of micro fragments on top of that colony. And then as they grow, if they're the same individual, the same genotype, Will actually fuse. And so scientists are trying to get these colonies to fuse over and reskin uh, these old um, skeletons. And so as with anything, there are successes and there are challenges. Uh, fortunately, we've had some awesome success, especially when it comes to branching corals, because that's what we've been working with and have kindly ma and have, uh, mastered. Uh, we've seen extremely high survivorship and growth, both in nurseries and on the reef. Uh, so much so that thousands of uh, corals are being outplanted onto Florida's coral reef every single year throughout restoration programs across the state. And even globally, we've just seen a huge explosion in coral restoration. There are over 350 projects around the world. And then very excitingly, we've seen our restored colonies actually sexually reproduce. So they're They've been attached to the reef, they've grown enough and have gotten comfortable enough that they sexually reproduce. And that's so important because that will allow for our efforts today to seed future generations of coral uh, beyond this initial work. But as anything, there are challenges. Again, our work with massives has only been over the past couple of years. So we're really just running experiments and seeing how we can improve. Uh, but we've seen some higher rates of predation on the massive corals. There's always the argument that the stressors that cause the coral decline in the first place aren't going away, um, but we're addressing that with some awesome research that Liv will talk about. Um, and then also how the asexual propagation that I described, you know, breaking the same colony, you end up with two genetically, or genetically identical individuals or clones. So there aren't any new traits or no new genetic diversity, which we really need uh, to increase the likelihood of 
uh, survivorship in light of different stressors. But Liv will also talk about how we're doing that. And even so, yeah, we're just seeing such amazing success. I love this uh, before and after series. This is a shot of one of our restoration plots right after we outplanted. And this isn't the same view, but it's the same plot a year later. And as you can see, we're seeing such incredible levels of growth and survivorship that's a whole new habitat there, so much more structure for coastal protection, so much more structure for fish to live. And it's really amazing. And I just wanted to close, I know I'm getting a little close on time, I could talk forever, but wanted to close with um, some additional information about how you guys can get involved. Uh, about five years ago now, we started, our lab started a program called Rescue a Reef. It's a citizen science initiative where any member of the general public can actually come out with us on a restoration expedition. And if you're a snorkeler, you watch from the surface. If you're a diver, you can actually come down to the reef or come to the nursery. You clean some of our coral trees with us. You collect your own coral fragments, and then you come with us to the reef on dive two and outplant coral colonies alongside of us. And it's been really amazing because not only does it allow us to, which is really important, allows us to increase what we're able to accomplish, uh, but it also just kind of drives home uh, passion and instills passion in people that come on these trips to go home and have these or generate these lifestyle switches and make these changes that will support our reefs from home and again, alleviate the stressors that have contributed to their decline. And that's what we really, really need in citizen science. Uh, really helps us achieve that. So we've been around for five years now, have hosted over 70 or 70 citizen scientist expeditions with over 800 volunteers and outplanted over 6,000 corals. And we also conducted a study to look at how the survivorship of our labs experts outplants did compared to the citizen scientists. And there was no significant difference. And you can actually see from this graph that the experts actually had, um, the experts being us in the lab, had higher levels of tissue mortality. So our citizen scientists were even doing a little bit better than us. So it's a great way to maximize our efforts and, and we know that it's been successful. So then finally, just wanted to touch on a project that Rescue Reef was a part of that has kind of involved a lot of what I talked about and a little what Liv is going to talk about in the future or in a couple minutes. <laughs> but, um, when we had the Super Bowl here in Miami uh, two years ago, the NFL Green always organizes a year of service in the host uh, city prior to the big game. And they do all these uh, initiatives and they normally plant trees, but they were like, we're in Miami, let's plant coral, reach out to us. Uh, and they looped in a really amazing organization called Force Blue. Uh, it's an organization that uh, helps uh, link up special ops veterans when they come back from combat with ocean conservation missions to allow them to use the skills that they developed overseas towards um, conservation missions at home. And it does so much good for us. It does so much good for their well-being, and it allows them to continue being heroes uh, even as they come home. And so we've outplanted, as you can see, thousands of staghorn coral, hundreds of massive coral species. We transplanted sea urchins. They're an important herbivore. So they help graze down the algae levy level at the site. And we also worked with Seacor and the Florida Aquarium to outplant corals that were actually bred uh, within their laboratories, which means we're outplanting genetically distinct individuals that might be um, might have these new traits that will help them withstand some of the stressors that have contributed to decline in the past, which is so exciting. I'm excited for Liv's talk more about sexual reproduction. And then just wanted to close with um, NOAA fortunately funded Force Blue to create a documentary about this whole series. Uh, it continued through the Tampa Super Bowl as well when we, it was still in Florida, Florida Aquariums in Tampa, and they funded our work for a whole nother year. We uh, achieved so much more, again, thanks to this uh, funding and just amazing to be under the spotlight of the biggest game uh, in the whole world. And so they made this documentary about it, 100 Yards of Hope, that tells the story of our efforts and what it means to the scientists, what it means to the veterans. They did a screening of it at, Force, or at Frost Science last night. Mayor Levine Kava came and gave an introduction. And it's a really amazing film and it'll actually be available online at 100yardsofhope.com, quick shameless plug, uh, starting tomorrow for a couple days. I highly encourage you to tune in. It's going to be taken down because they want a streaming service to pick it up and streaming services won't pick up something that everyone can already watch. 
Uh, so take advantage of this time. And uh, that's about it. I went like a minute over what I was supposed to, but thank you guys so much for your attention. All right, thank you so much, Maddie, for that fantastic talk. Yes, it was fantastic, uh, it was great. Can you uh, repeat though, the 100 Yards of Hope, when will that be uh, available to watch? So it will be launched online tomorrow. Uh, I think it'll be available for about a week. Um, online, okay, so online. you need to go to that website and you can watch it there. Yeah, is that right? Okay. That yeah, that was that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, live, Liz, live. Excuse live. me. <laughs> Short for Olivia. Nice, it's a nice name. Okay, you. I guess you're all set, ready to go. Great. Yes. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Fabulous. All right, I'm going to try to just roll into it from what Maddie was talking about. So thank you for that wonderful start to our evening, Maddie. Um, so Maddie was telling us all the incredible, amazing ways that. Uh, our groups at the University of Miami and all of our fantastic partners near and far have been working to boost coral cover on our declining reefs. But the question remains, how do we make sure that these corals don't uh, face the same fate of their of their predecessors who have who have declined because of bleaching, climate change, uh, disease, pollution, etc. Um, so what we're really trying to also make sure that we we focus on is how do we boost the resilience of these corals that we're actually putting out onto the reefs so that they can survive into the future for generations to come and help to, to restore our reefs for, for future generations. Um, that is one of the central questions that my lab, the Coral Reef Futures Lab at the University of Miami is working to try to answer along with all of our amazing partners, including the Learman Lab and Rescue Reef. Um, so we're really trying to test a bunch of different strategies to enhance coral survival, um, coral fitness, so how well they do in their environment, and their resilience, their ability to withstand stress and continue on into the future. Um, as they're faced with this slew of environmental changes and human impacts that, that Maddie laid out for us. So there are many different uh, ways that we can look at this and many different ways that we are looking at this. Um, kind of to start off, there are, as Maddie told us, corals are made up of the coral animal themselves, uh, the algal symbionts and other kind of partners that are involved in this holobiont. So there's actually different ways that you can approach the problem by focusing on different pieces of this holobiont. Um, I'm going to talk about first how we can address increasing resilience from the point of view of the algal symbionts that corals host. Um, and I'll also talk about increasing resilience from the point of view of the coral animal. And these actually work together. They're not mutually exclusive. And that's why we're trying to um, attempt lots and lots of different intervention strategies from many different angles. So the first angle is the symbionts. So Maddie briefly went over this, but uh, a healthy coral is the one on the left that you see here. They are colorful. They have algal symbionts in their tissues. These algal symbionts are photosynthesizing. They're using sunlight to produce energy for the coral and helping the coral grow big and strong. When the coral is faced with environmental stress, in particular high temperature, which we're seeing more and more now because of climate change, um, this symbiosis breaks down. The photosynthesis no longer works and the coral actually ejects the algal symbionts that are inside of its tissues. This turns the coral white because you can see through the coral tissue to the, to the white um, calcium carbonate skeleton underneath. But this coral is not dead yet. Um, it's just lacking its most important nutrient source, uh, the symbionts that were giving it energy. If it stays in this state for a few weeks to months, it can die because it basically starves. It no longer has the source of energy. But if those conditions uh, go back to normal, so if the water temperature goes back down, um, corals can actually recover and regain their algal symbionts, uh, restart their symbiosis and be healthy once again. So our lab is interested in trying to basically take advantage of this process by pre-exposing corals to um, a low level of temperature stress in order to basically make them bleach a little bit and then recover them in a controlled laboratory setting so that they are pre-exposed to high temperature. And when they actually recover, they recover with this heat tolerant type of algal symbiont called duracinium. The name isn't important, but the point is that this type of algal symbiont is actually hardier and stronger and can withstand heat stress better than whatever that coral was hosting before. Um, and it's been found by our lab and by others that this intervention actually increasing the coral's future bleaching 
uh, increases the coral's future bleaching threshold by two degrees Celsius or about four degrees Fahrenheit, which is actually a big amount when you're talking about ocean temperatures. Right now, what we're talking about with trying to keep climate change under control and trying to keep um, global temperatures from rising too much, our current sort of goal globally is to try to keep temperatures from rising two degrees Celsius. Um, we'll see how on track with that we are. We're not super on track with it right now, but if we can just uh, help corals switch their symbionts to something more thermally tolerant, we might actually be able to kind of buy them that two degrees Celsius window. So this intervention alone is, is showing some promise um, in lots of different coral species, both here in the Caribbean and Florida and in the Pacific. Now from the point of view of the coral animal. Um, so not all corals are created equal. The animal themselves also have lots of different uh, traits that they, they have because of their genetic makeup. And that means that different coral animals are actually more thermally tolerant than others. We're able to run experiments in the lab um, and actually in the field to basically give a, a, sh a short stress test, a short heat stress test to lots and lots of different coral genotypes. For example, all of the different genotypes that Maddie and her group at Rescue a Reef uh, propagate and use for outplanting all the time in their nurseries. We can take representative corals from that, expose them all to a heat stress test that's very standardized, and then rank how each one um, each one performs in the face of that so that we know that these genotypes are the most thermally tolerant ones. These ones are maybe a little more thermally sensitive. And that way we can try to prioritize the genotypes that uh, seem to fare better under heat stress and don't, don't bleach. And we can use those for future uh, restoration efforts. Similarly, thermal stress is not the only thing we're interested in. We're also interested in trying to make sure we're outplanting disease tolerant corals. Um, so just as uh, we see sort of bleaching events come through and some corals do better than others. Um, in the face of stony coral tissue loss disease, the disease that Maddie briefly mentioned, which has absolutely ravaged a lot of coral species here in Florida and in the rest of the Caribbean, um, as those diseases sweep through, some colonies are spared. We don't exactly understand why yet, but there's definitely something in their genetic makeup that makes them more tolerant for some reason, more resistant to this pathogen. Um, and therefore, both Rescue Reef and our lab are interested in trying to target these colonies that have survived the disease outbreak for future studies and certainly for future propagation and outplanting because we want those resilient, resistant genotypes out there helping to rebuild our reefs. So we're using sort of thermal tolerance tests, we're using disease tests to try to target specific um, massive corals and branching corals for our restoration and, and propagation efforts um, that Maddie was talking about. So basically using all of these really strong genotypes that already exist in nature that are there for the taking um, to kind of prioritize those and outplant a, a slew of those resistant genotypes together as a part of our restoration efforts. Um, one more piece of that is taking advantage of some local thermal gradients um, to do a process called managed relocation. So even here in Florida, this map on the left shows actually just Biscayne Bay. There are pretty drastically different thermal regimes right here. So down in the south of Biscayne Bay, that water tends to be a lot warmer than um, the water in the north of Biscayne Bay and going up toward Miami-Dade and Broward. And corals live in both of those places already. So corals are living in those warmer waters and doing really well. So we think that if we move some of those corals from down south where they're already kind of adapted to that heat um, up to the north where in the next 10 years it's predicted that the temperatures will rise that much, um, we'll kind of be ahead of climate change a little bit. We'll be um, seeding those areas with genotypes that are already a little bit thermally tolerant so that when high temperatures do reach those areas, there will be some members of the coral communities there that are kind of ready for those bleaching events and that will uh, withstand that heat stress. So that's managed relocation that we're working on, um, mainly with branching corals, but also working on that hopefully with some other species as well. So all of this so far um, is talking about asexual reproduction, which Maddie mentioned, um, creates a ton of coral tissue, a ton of biomass, if you will. We're able to propagate and grow these corals, make a reef go from you know, flat to beautiful and, and rugose or, or very structurally complex in just a year with those photos that she showed. Um, but unfortunately, that process doesn't create any new genetic diversity. Every time that you're fragmenting these corals, those are clones of one another. So that's 
us basically working with what we already have. And, and we're losing a lot of that genetic diversity as some of these genotypes die because of the climate change impacts and human impacts that we're seeing. Um, so we need to um, add to our asexual reproduction sort of pipeline, um, the sexual reproduction side of things. Uh, this is really advantageous and complementary to some of the other restoration work that we do because sexual reproduction, just like in humans, in corals creates brand new genetic diversity, unique combinations, unique people, unique polyps that uh, didn't exist before and that have, you know, potentially have traits that are, are going to help them withstand future environmental change. Um, the problem with that approach is that Coral babies are small, just like human babies are small. They start life really small and they grow really slowly and take a long time to become a big, beautiful colony that's going to make the reef, you know, super structurally complex again. So this kind of gives us high genetic diversity, but low biomass. Therefore, combining these two approaches is really the best approach for reef restoration. And that's what we're working on doing at the University of Miami and in Florida in general with lots and lots of different partners. So how do corals reproduce sexually? This is my favorite thing in the world to talk about and my specialty. Um, so corals spawn. Uh, many of the corals, at least here in Florida, that we're interested in are um, broadcast spawners, which means that a few nights of the year, they all coordinate to release their gametes, their eggs and their sperm, all at the same time. Um, and so we want to take advantage of this process with two goals. One, to increase the number of baby corals that actually make it and survive on degraded reefs. And two, to boost the resilience of those baby corals, like I've been talking about doing in adult corals, so that they're able to withstand future stress. So coral spawning is one of the coolest things you can see, I think, ever, um, because these coral colonies coordinate to release their gamete bundles all at once at night. It looks incredible. It's like being in a snow globe underwater. Um, these corals that you see in this video are hermaphrodites. So these little bundles are actually eggs and sperm bundled together. Uh, they produce both eggs and sperm. Um, and so if you hear me use the term gametes, I'm just referring to eggs and sperm. Um, that just means reproductive cells in an animal. So it's pretty cool. Um, and the coolest part is that the whole reef does it at once. So you're swimming at night going to collect your coral gametes and you just are in the middle of this snow globe uh, with, with coral gametes all around you and corals spawning all around you. It's incredible, it's amazing. And this only happens on a few nights a year when corals, which don't even have brains, they're these little animals that we think are quite primitive. They look like anemones or jellyfish. They somehow interpret cues from the environment, lunar cues, so they spawn after the full moon, temperature cues, they only spawn in the summer months when it's hot, even cues from the wind. Uh, they usually choose nights that are a little bit calmer because that means it's like the doldrums of summer. Um, they somehow are able to detect all of these things without speaking to each other, without the internet, and coordinate to all release their, their gametes all at once across the reef and across the region. So corals in Florida will reproduce at the same time as corals in Curacao, which are hundreds of miles away, but you're using these same kind of environmental cues that they've evolved to have to, to do this all at once. It's, it's pretty amazing and I never cease to be just on awed by it. <laughs> so we take advantage of this process by collecting a subset of these gametes. Not all of them, we're not taking all the babies off the reef, um, but we're going to kind of help shepherd some of these babies through the beginning of life because they start life really small. So we use these mesh nets to collect the gamete bundles as they float upward. They are positively buoyant, so they float upward into the jars at the top of these mesh nets and we put nets over each of the colonies that are spawning as they do. Once those jars are full, we cap them off and bring them to the surface where we mix them all together. For the most part, we tend to mix the gametes from all the different parents that spawn on a given night because you wanna have as much diversity as possible in your batch of offspring. Um, we really like to try to mix, if we get eight colonies, we're gonna mix all of those batches together because then the eggs and sperm from all eight colonies will mix together and make whatever that permutation is eight times eight times eight of all kinds of different uh, different combinations. And each one of those little baby corals that's created is totally unique and its own new genotype that could potentially have some benefit for, for coral populations going forward. Maybe one of those babies is really thermally tolerant. Maybe one of those babies is disease resistant. Um, so we want to try to make as many different combinations as we can. And from there, we raise them. So once they're fertilized, they become swimming larvae. Corals, it's hard to imagine that these huge things that you make reefs that you can see from space that can be the size of a car or a bus in some cases, start life as these teeny tiny little amoeba looking, bug looking, 
swimming dots. Uh, they swim around, they're not even attached to the sea floor yet. It's totally amazing and blows my mind every time I see it. Um, and eventually those swimming babies, after a few days or weeks, decide that it's time to find a permanent home to settle on. So they actually start sniffing around on the bottom of the ocean, trying to find a place where they'll settle permanently. They tend to use kind of chemical cues. They, they kind of smell and smell for things that smell like a reef. Um, they avoid places that have too much algae that might grow over them, macroalgae, seaweed. And they try to choose places that have other corals or even reef fish. They're able to detect uh, chemicals from those as well. And they eventually choose a place to permanently settle. We try to take advantage of this process by putting coral larvae into these large pools with tons and tons of different substrates, we call them, these little um, spaceship looking kind of settlement units so that the coral babies can choose to settle on all of these units and then we can have them to put to different sites to outplant easily uh, onto the reef later. So then each of these little settlement units is seeded with a bunch of baby corals, which we can then easily move and, and put onto the reef. So as they develop, uh, they start to look like an actual coral. They, after a few weeks, they form a mouth and tentacles and they start to take up algae, uh, the algal symbionts that I was talking about earlier. This is a great window in time actually to do one of our interventions that we were talking about earlier, exposing them to these heat tolerant algae so that they can start life uh, with a higher bleaching threshold than some of their partners that, that maybe have different uh, algal types. So this is part of my research and something that we've been pretty successful with doing so far at taking advantage of this early stage and giving coral babies heat tolerant algae from the very beginning of their lives. It's also important because they tend to spawn and be reproducing and, and make coral babies at the very uh, sort of middle of the summer, so the hottest time of year, and therefore they're going out onto the reef when they might experience a heat wave. So giving them that little boost where they're going to be nice and heat tolerant from the very beginning might just help more of them survive. Um, yeah, so then these settlement units that they can, that they're settled on are, are outplanted. Um, these baby corals are outplanted to the reef. They start really tiny. You can see some little dots and that's all they look like. They're like the size of a grain of sand or a grain of rice if we're lucky um, when they're you know a few weeks or a few months old. And then eventually they grow after a few months, years, if they do okay, um, into new colonies, their own brand new colonies. And each one of those hundreds, thousands of little baby corals, again, is its own genotype. If each, If even a fraction of those make it, that's uh, exponentially increasing the genetic diversity that's there on that reef. So it's so so worth the effort and we're so excited to be able to, to do this and shepherd these baby corals into their new lives. Um, this brings me to this amazing consortium of groups that we have started to work with um, that, have, that make up the Southeast uh, Florida Coral Reef Restoration Hub. It uh, includes the University of Miami's Rosensteel School, CCOR, which Maddie mentioned, who are coral reproduction experts, Frost Science, the College of Engineering at the University of Miami, Florida Aquarium, also re coral reef reproduction experts, and uh, Nova Southeastern University. And we're all working together um, to achieve some really, really cool milestones over the next few years that have to do with both what I've talked about and what Maddie talked about all together. So one of those awesome milestones that we reached last year, as Maddie mentioned, was that our uh, restored populations of, of staghorn corals here in Miami actually spawned for the first time. So once again, this is the, the culmination of what we want from reef restoration, right? We don't want to have to actively put corals out onto the reef for the next whatever, decades, hundreds of years. It needs to be a population that can eventually sustain itself and be, you know, creating new generations uh, without our intervention. So that's what we saw. We were able to collect um, some of the spawn from these corals, uh, raise their, their babies and outplant them back to the reef. So we're sort of seeing this come full circle. Um, and this year we have even bigger plans to watch for these restored corals and as they spawn um, and do more with those offspring. So we're just so excited that that has happened and that's all really rescue a reef, let it, um, but this whole consortium of folks were involved in, in raising those babies. Um, so along with those uh, staghorn babies, we also 
collectively were able to watch for spawning in three other species. And so we actually in 2020, we got four species that spawn that we were able to rear and outplant some of. Um, and this year we actually already have one species that has spawned and that we're rearing. So that's really, really exciting. Um, so together this, this group of various institutions, the Restoration Hub has a goal of outplanting 150,000 new coral babies onto the reefs here in Miami-Dade and Broward in the next three years. And I'm happy to say that we've already made a big dent in that thanks to really intense and crazy efforts last year because of COVID, but we were really, really successful. So really thrilled uh, so far at what, what we've been able to do. So moving on from that, um, another really cool advancement in coral spawning is being able to actually induce it artificially in the lab. Um, so the Florida Aquarium, which is one of the partners in the Restoration Hub, has done this really well for the last few years. Basically, you keep corals in these tanks with um, sort of lunar conditions that you're simulating, water uh, conditions that you're simulating, making them think that it's the time for them to spawn whenever you program it to be. Um, and that just frees up so much uh, sort of ability to do research and work with these coral babies and create them at different times of year or times that are easier than, you know, than that midnight <laughs> on a night when it's stormy you don't have to contend with weather um, you don't have to contend with you know boats you can just be there in the lab and and get these coral babies it's really amazing that they've been able to do that and we're just building one at the university of miami which is coming online like this month which is super exciting um, so we're really looking forward to being able to create lots and lots of offspring from lots and lots of species with just a lot more predictability um, and do do a lot more with them in these systems. And then another thing that this helps free up for us is the, avail uh, the ability to selectively breed. So there's this great new technology called cryopreservation, which is already used in everything from endangered rhinos to humans to basically help fertility. It's more like it's, it's sort of a accepted series of techniques for fertility clinics, if you will, um, but it's only recently been developed to work for coral sperm. And basically we're able to freeze coral sperm, but it remains alive um, to thaw at any point in the future to use or to have as a gene bank. So frozen, um, it is cells from a coral. So it's, we're able to bank whatever it is that that coral has from its own genetic material. But in the future, we're able to thaw it and use it to fertilize fresh eggs. This opens up a world of opportunities because we can cross parents that never would be able to uh, mate in nature because they're too far away from one another or maybe they spawn on a different day or something like that. So we're actually able to travel with this cryopreserved sperm and, and selectively breed uh, to create brand new diversity that wouldn't have ever existed in nature. And also to choose um, sort of more robust parents. If we have a parent that has survived a bleaching event and a parent that has survived a disease outbreak, we can try to mix their gametes together to make the most robust possible offspring. Um, and that's where we're going in the future really, really soon. And actually last month we were able to do this for the first time with grooved brain corals, one of our key reef building species here in Florida um, by mixing, by using cryopreserved sperm to um, selectively breed colonies from, that were originally sourced from the dry tortugas that have been living in the lab at the Florida Aquarium for years now with colonies here in Miami that survived a disease outbreak. So we're hoping that those offspring are maybe more uh, resistant to stony coral tissue loss disease. We're currently raising those offspring and we're soon going to test their disease resistance and see if this intervention helped us make a new generation of more disease resistant brain corals. So really hoping that that's uh, the case. Um, and then finally, just more work that the Restoration Hub is doing. Um, we've recently built this huge uh, system at the hatchery at the University of Miami's experimental hatchery to help grow out hundreds, thousands of coral fragments, doing the microfragmenting techniques that Maddie talked about, as well as raising um, baby corals that we create from these spawning events and just have a lot more capacity. As you've kind of seen in a lot of my photos, those are a lot of the time in these lab tanks, indoor lab tanks that kind of are pretty limited for space. And um, these tanks are, are 
much bigger, you know, this, this system is much more of a kind of a farming, a gardening process that we want to be starting so that we can really churn out numbers that will help us bring our reef restoration to scale. That's what really needs to happen now that we've kind of honed a lot of these techniques in the lab. Um, you know, that takes a lot of manpower that's kind of on the small scale. How do we make this bigger so that we can restore not on the scale of meters, but on the scale of reefs on the scale of miles um, and really help to bring change here in the Florida Reef Tract. So we're well on the way to, to having the capacity to do that. Um, we're also thinking of corals not only from a bi their biological importance, but also just for our incredibly uh, valuable Miami real estate. Part of the restoration hub, as you may have noticed, was the College of Engineering at the University of Miami. So they're working um, on creating living breakwaters, um, basically creating structures out of composite materials that include corals on them to help to attenuate wave action and create this self-regenerating living breakwater to help um, reduce erosion and keep storm damage at a minimum uh, for our very valuable coastal properties here in Miami. So that's really interesting, a way to kind of combine um, uh, engineering with ecological restoration in this way that benefits both the ecosystem and, uh, and our communities. And then finally, we're trying to take a really holistic approach at reef restoration, not only thinking about the corals, but the other animals and pieces of the ecosystem that support them. And herbivores are a really, really important piece of that. Um, so Maddie also mentioned the long spine sea urchin, diadema antelarum, um, which also declined in the Caribbean in the last few decades because of a major disease outbreak. Um, but they are one of the biggest algal grazers and corals really rely on them to help free up space on the bottom of the ocean for new coral babies to be able to um, recruit themselves to be able to attach and, and start growing. And just so that they don't get, uh, adult corals don't get overgrown by, um, by algae and other things. So uh, the restoration hub is working on raising, uh, basically reproducing, raising and outplanting uh, long spine sea urchins along with the corals that they outplant so that we're not only putting corals out there but we're also putting pieces of the ecosystem back with them that will help to just sort of maintain the whole system in a nice balance uh, that is sustainable. So <laughs> that is uh, a short summary of all the things that we're doing. I'm sure I've missed plenty of them. Um, but what we really want to wrap up with here and feel free to chime in, Maddie, is, okay, so what can you do to help with all of this? Um, there are a lot of things that you can do. So first of all, thank you for listening to us, um, <laughs> learning about what a coral reef is, why it's important, and sharing that knowledge with others that maybe aren't nerdy scientists like us um, is just a great way to spread the word, raise awareness. You know, the more that people know about the plate of coral reefs, the more that they might care and, and try to do something about it. So thank you for listening and please share what you've heard. Um, saving energy in as many ways as you can. Uh, conserving your water usage and reducing your carbon footprint, you know, reducing, reusing, recycling, all the things that help keep the environment clean will also help to keep coral reefs clean and, and our oceans in general um, healthy. So all of that's really important. Um, fishing and boating responsibly. Coral reefs are an ecosystem, so they rely really heavily on the fish communities and just marine um, animal communities in general that are a part of them. So uh, we want to make sure that those are also intact. Um, and you know, just as far as physical damage goes, we don't wanna run our boats into them or uh, you know, if throw our anchors on them or anything like that. So just recreating responsibly is, a, is an important thing as a South Florida resident. Um, supporting your local government. So here in South Florida, luckily, well, luckily or unluckily, we are you know, kind of the, the, the ground zero of climate change and a lot of our politicians are aware of that. And so supporting a lot of those folks that are really working on a local level to try to um, put forward reef and ocean conservation efforts uh, would be great. <laughs> and then on a kind of more macro scale, trying to vote for leaders that prioritize climate action, because as Maddie said, and I will echo it, all of this amazing work that we're doing um, is really sort of a buying us some time. And the, the ultimate solution is, is very much global climate action that will help to reduce carbon emissions. Um, that is that is the thing that will save coral reefs and many, many other ecosystems that are in peril. So uh, voting for leaders that prioritize climate, climate action, I would argue is probably num thing number one you can do, but you know. And then finally, as Maddie told you, you can support our research and restoration efforts and maybe even come with us on a dive and help us plant some corals. Who knows, maybe your coral will become the next uh, one that we're using for 
selective breeding or something like that. Who knows? So please come and join us. And uh, Maddie, did you have anything to add to that that I missed? <laughs> no, that was perfect. The only thing I would add, just also because of the nonprofit that I work for, mm -hmm. Liv touched on it, is avoiding plastics, which mm. both helps with climate change since 99% of plastics are made from fossil fuels. And then also reduces marine debris. Plastics can transmit disease between corals. There's actually one wild study out of the Pacific that found that the likelihood of disease increased from 4% to 89% if a wow. colony was packed with plastic. So it's a great way to help with both the disease and the climate change front. But no, that was awesome. Great job. I didn't even know that. Thank you for that. <laughs> and then finally, please, please, please uh, find us on all the things, ask us all the questions, you know, stay engaged. Um, we love to answer questions. We would love to work with anyone who's interested in working with us. So uh, follow all these great groups. And thank you so, so, so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Well, we can't thank you enough uh, for being here tonight, for the work that you do, for the passion that you have for your work. It's just wonderful. And uh, uh, the presentations 